this shotgun is phenomenal. All right, you still filming this thing? Yeah. All right. Hey guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian. I am out here today with the most tactical shotgun I could find made before 1980. And I think I did well. This is a high standard Model 10B. Now there was also a Model 10A, which we'll get to in a moment. It is a semi-automatic bullpup shotgun. These were originally conceived by a fellow named Alfred Crouch. He was actually a police sergeant at the time. In 1957, he got the idea to do this and he patented it. What he initially did was he took a Remington 1148 semi-auto shotgun and he built it into a bullpup carriage, kind of like this one. Um, tinkered with the idea for a number of years. Finally, you know, he's trying to find a client, someone to build them, some way to get them to market. Ultimately, in 1965, he was able to sell this patent and concept to the High Standard Company. High Standard took the idea, they tweaked it a little bit, and they put it together on one of their existing, fairly reliable and, and popular shotguns, the Flight King. So they then took this concept and marketed it pretty much exclusively to police. This was going to be like the modern police cruiser shotgun. And it has a number of features to it designed specifically for law enforcement. First off, you'll notice that the buttstock swivels. The idea with this is that because this is a bullpup shotgun, it can be used one-handed, which is true. Now, if I should have to do something and I don't want the gun uh, up in my shoulder, rather than holding it down here, what you're supposed to do is rotate the butt plate kind of horizontal and put it up against your bicep and use that as a way to brace the back end of the shotgun. And so then you can go doing stuff with one hand, with your left hand, while still fully controlling the gun with your right hand. Um, it seems like a really goofy idea. That's actually not a horrible idea. I've seen worse out there. Uh, now this also has a big old carry handle on it for convenience. We have a big rear iron sight here and the front blade actually flips down, because otherwise you'd get caught on everything. And as you can clearly see, I have a gigantic 2D cell mag light mounted to the side of this thing. This is a someone's proprietary made clip uh, to hold a mag light. Originally, there was a what was called a Kel light. Basically, a, an off-brand mag light was built with the specific mounting uh, hardware to fit onto the high standard 10B. Now, I mentioned there was also a 10A. The main visible difference between the A and the B models was that the A had the flashlight built into this chassis right up here above the barrel in front of the gun. Uh, had iron sights up on top of it. It said built-in flashlight, built-in switch. Really a, a cool way to fulfill the whole concept. Um, the problem was some people didn't like it. It was harder to access the flashlight. Um, and ultimately with the, the B model, they switched to just mounting the light on the side. The other thing they did with the B model was they added a uh, charging handle on the left in addition to the existing charging handle on the right. So if you take this out of its chassis, which we will in a few minutes, it's basically just a semi-automatic shotgun with the stock taken off and all of this stuff added onto it. Um, you'll be surprised when I take it apart how much it looks just like a plain normal shotgun. Um, safety is just a cross bolt button in front of the trigger guard. You do not shoot this thing left-handed for the same reason you don't shoot virtually any bullpup left-handed in that you will eat the brass. Um, the one other thing I should point out before I do some shooting is that these are specifically designed only for high brass and magnum loads. Uh, 12 gauge, they're all 12 gauge, only two and three quarter chambers. You can't use three inch shells, but they will typically not reliably run, you know, just the cheap low brass birdshot. Uh, high brass birdshot works, buckshot works, slugs work. A, a lot of people use that to say that this gun's kind of a piece of crap. Um, in reality, you know, these were marketed to law enforcement. There's no huge need for law enforcement to be running around with, you know, cheap Walmart bulk pack low end birdshot. They're going to be using buckshot and slugs to actually get the job done. So that's what the gun was designed to run on. Um, why don't I go ahead and uh, give you a little sample here. 
All right, so loading procedure is, I should have filmed it, but pretty simply, you drop one in the chamber, you hit the bolt release, you then load the tube underneath. I've got four rounds in it right now. In theory, it'll hold five, four plus one in the chamber. But bolt the charging, the uh, carry handle down, otherwise it blocks your iron sights. And then it fails to work because I just talked it up so well. What did I do? There it went. Something ain't quite right with this one. Um, butt stroking, it does get it back into action though. So that's about as tactical as a cheap M4 carbine. Because yeah. you're pretty much doing the same butt stroke clearing per shot fired. Yeah, pretty much. All right, okay, yeah. cool. Well, it's not normal. I'm not sure exactly why. Uh, the high brass bird didn't really want to work. I'm pretty much butt stroking it every time to get the thing to close. So let me try that again with, I'm gonna try buckshot, which will be even more fun to shoot. Hopefully it might actually run the gun. Mm. The butt stroking thing worked with the bird shot. Oh! oh. <laughs> yeah! yeah. <laughs> I got one in it. Now, Okay, we've got three rounds of buckshot. Ready? Nope. All right. Bolt closed, but it's not chambered. There we go. All right, so I think that's about as effective as I'm gonna be able to get this thing running. Um, you know, these have a reputation for kind of being crap and I can see where it comes from now. I was really hoping that this was just an issue with cheap birdshot, but uh, you know, it's giving me the same problems with everything here. So I'm going to stop bothering trying to shoot this. And I'm gonna go ahead and take it apart. We'll go inside and I'll show you guys the inner workings of this thing. All right, before we go any farther, I pulled this thing apart so that I could fix it so that it would run properly. We figured out what the problem was, but it's not something we can keep fixed. So the problem is the pin, we have our hammer right here. The pin that holds it on runs between these two blocks and it's sliding slightly out the side. So you can just barely see it right there. There you go, you can see it right there. It's coming out and what's happening is it's obstructing the lifter. And when the lifter won't go up, then the action won't close. So if I can push that pin back in place, there we go. All right, now that pin is back in place. Now the lifter will rise. So the problem we were having was that we could fix that once, but then as soon as we put the gun back together, the recoil from the first shot would cause the pin to slide out again and the problem to start all over. Anyway, now that we've got that fixed, I can put this gun back together and then show you how it properly works and comes apart. Okay, so proper disassembly. As I mentioned before, this whole thing is basically just a typical high standard semi-auto gas operated shotgun inside a shell. So. Let's start by pulling all the shell off. The flashlight can go. Then this flashlight mounting bracket, which I believe was custom made by somebody. There's a big thumb screw on this side and I can take this off. It is held in place by two locating pins and a central screw. So there's that. Now the next step is at the buttstock, this recoil plate, what you want to do, sometimes they have a little detent or a little Allen screw inside this hole. This one does not. What I do is push it in and then unthread. It's kind of like a child safety lock. Now this has this little uh, thin wobbly washer there. That puts pressure on the buttstock to push it backwards so that it doesn't come unthreaded 
during normal use. So that's the butt plate, first step. Now, with the butt plate off, we can pull this whole rear plastic shell off of the gun. All right, I am sort of going to skip ahead here and I'm gonna go ahead and take off the front sight. There is a little hex screw, very, very small hex screw right there. I'm going to bring that out a bit. Once that is out, the whole front sight assembly threads off. This will be necessary for taking off the rest of the housing. There we go. One front sight assembly. Right, now we can move on to the rest of the housing. I need to take this screw off because this plug is what holds the top and bottom of the shell together. So, screw and nose cap come off. All right, now that the nose cap is off, I can take this whole assembly and pull it forward. This is the upper and lower housing. Slides forward, then this uh, ambi charging handle comes off. This is simply a metal plate and a charging handle. So that comes off. Now the upper and lower assemblies are separate. The top, once I have the uh, front side off, the top just slides right off. This is simply an empty plastic shell and then the lower assembly, I just have to pull these rods out of this bit, and then this comes off. So here is the actual, the actual guts of the 10B. It's a typical high standard shotgun. Now the operating mechanism for these is actually pretty cool. It has a gas port in the barrel right here, and then this is our gas piston right there. All right, so our gas piston here actually is riding on the outside of the magazine too. There's a very tight mechanical fit on those two. It's a very precise fit. Uh, and gas is actually pushed both into the front of the bolt here, or the piston here, but also underneath inside between the tube and the piston. So it kind of has this little layer of gas to float on, which actually works pretty well. As a side note, this is part of why it's hard to find extended magazine tubes for these guns, because it's not just a matter of plugging something on the end. It's replacing this tube, and it has to be just as carefully fitted so that the gas system will work with the extended tube. Um, I believe High Standard made those for a little while, but they're pretty hard to find, and for this reason, none of the modern reproduction type uh, accessory companies bother with a tube for this gun. Anyway, the piston itself pushes on a pair of operating arms right here. Those go back to the bolt. So when I push the piston back, the bolt travels. Now if I push the piston all the way back, we're going to lock open. In order to close it, hit the release, bolt goes forward. Now let's pull the trigger assembly out. These two pins hold in the trigger group. This one's really finicky. There we go. So two pins, and they have little flat springs to hold them captive in the receiver, which is a good idea. Now, trigger assembly comes out and lifter. This is the hammer. Obviously that's the shell lifter. And the trigger is actually this flat bit. So when I push up on this, the hammer goes forward. Recocked, push up, and release the hammer. Now when we have the lower assembly here, you saw these two rods coming out the back. This sets in the trigger mechanism just like that. And when you pull the trigger, you push those rods back, which push this little triangular bit against the trigger, causing it to fire. Inside the trigger itself, 
it's really very simple. It's nothing but a little spring-loaded push. That's all the trigger does is push that back. All right, that's our trigger. Now let's take a look at the locking system. This has a rising block to lock. Kind of an interesting system. What I need to do, I pull the bolt all the way back and these levers are going to pop off and disengage. Then from the inside, I can wiggle the pieces around a bit. There we go, there's our carrier. And then bolt handle and the bolt itself. This is our actual locking block. When the bolt goes forward, that gets pushed up. There's a recess on the top of the receiver right there. And this round block gets pushed into it, like so. This is our ejector. When the bolt hits the back of the receiver, this gets pushed forward, ejects the cartridge. Pretty simple. And then our bolt carrier here has this set of angled guide, rod, guide rails in it so that when the carrier is all the way forward, it pushes that block up. When the carrier comes back, it pulls that block down. Then the guide rails from the gas piston attach to this and they lock into these little square recesses on the bottom of the carrier. So that is how the whole thing works. And oh, I guess lastly, there is our firing pin right in there. Hammer hits that to fire. Oh, right, bolt handle. So the bolt handle is also quite simple. It's got this half round shape. It simply sits right there in the bolt carrier. When the bolt itself is on top, there's no way it can come out. But when you pull the carrier off, it just falls out. Pretty clever, actually. All right, so you know this wasn't necessarily a terrible concept. I have no idea how effective or reliable or, or high quality uh, the original prototype of this built on that uh, Remington 1148 was. For all we know, it could have been fantastic, and then High Standard could have kind of yeah, messed it up with their iteration. Uh, on the other hand, it could have been crap to begin with, and we may be thanking High Standard for making it as good as this actually was. I really can't say. Um, certainly the concept is valid. It's uh, a very interesting gun to take a look at. Uh, not necessarily the one I would choose, though. All right, guys, I don't have it on camera because the gun keeps malfunctioning on us, but I did actually try shooting it like this from the bicep. And it works, but it's a little painful. It's not very pleasant. Um, I do also want to point out that the, the sight alignment is pretty much aligned with the flashlight. So if you were in a dark alley or building, you can more or less point shoot this thing based on the flashlight. Whether or not that's a sound, moral, and tactical idea at the time is, I don't know, that's anyone's guess. But technologically, yeah, it kind of works. Um, not a whole lot else to say about this. This was adopted by, a, I think, a fair number of police departments in the early, early to mid-1970s. Uh, these first went into production in 1967, so you do run into some of them without serial numbers. High Standard generally didn't serialize its guns until the 1968 NFA required it to. Um, and then they were manufactured up until about 1977. Uh, both the A and the B types were made. Uh, you do see them around from time to time now. They're kind of a cool collector's item. They were, you know, this is the sort of thing that was cutting edge top of the line in 1970. And yeah, maybe not so much anymore, but definitely a neat piece to look at. So I hope you guys enjoyed the video. Uh, definitely check out the other videos we have on cool old tactical shotguns at ForgottenWeapons.com. Thanks for watching.